So here we go again. Um, I must say when I don't, I work on Kubernetes like I think a couple of you here. And when I, when I read the outline of this talk, uh, I must say I absolutely don't care about Kubernetes. I, I study physics, so for me CERN is the mecca or something close to it. So when I was particularly excited to, 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 to hear what Jack, our friend Jack Enche, engineer at CERN, has to tell us. So please give it up for, for Jack. Good luck. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the nice introduction. Yes, so I'll be talking about how we're using Kubernetes and OpenShift at CERN. And I was getting a little bit worried before uh, when we had the talk from ING, from, from Robin, uh, about how they're having their namespace as a service product. But I promise you there will still be enough new things in this talk here. So first, a little bit about me. So I studied IT, security, and cloud computing at Aalto University in Finland. And uh, in my free time, I like cycling and also hiking in nature. And uh, Aya, then I'm also an engineer at CERN, which um, is actually quite nice because this is the landscape of CERN. So we have the Lake Geneva here, and at the tip there is Geneva. You can see in the background we have the Alps close by, so that's really good if you're into cycling and hiking. And yeah, here on the right side, there is the main campus. And this red ring here, that's the LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. That's this huge underground proton accelerator that we have where lots of experiments are being performed. You might also know that this guy was also working at CERN, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. And he invented the World Wide Web there. And, and what that also means is that we have a long legacy of running web services at CERN because the web was invented there. And most of these web services, well, actually all of them, are running in this data center. So this is the CERN data center. Uh, so basically everything we do is on-premise. Um, but actually 80% of the workload that's running in this data center is just what we call physics workload. So it's just running simulations, computations, analytics, machine learning, et cetera, et cetera. But more and more of our users, of course, also want modern ways of deploying applications, doing it in a cloud native way. And we, as the CERN IT department, offer two ways to do that. We have a Kubernetes service that is based on OpenShift Magnum, and uh, sorry, on OpenStack Magnum. And we have a managed Kubernetes service that is based on OKD. And we frequently get the question, why do you offer both? Like, I mean, managing, like doing a Kubernetes management is already enough of a hassle. Why do you duplicate the effort? And this is one of the things that I want to explain in this talk. Uh, because both of them have really different use cases. And in the end, I will also highlight the benefits of, of kind of splitting these use cases. So let's first have a look at the, the benefits of an unmanaged Kubernetes cluster. So it's basically like a VM. You create the thing, we give you an SSH key, and you are root on that thing. You can do whatever you like. You have the full control. If you want to install packages, or in the case of Kubernetes, you want to uh, deploy a service mesh, or you want a different CNI, or whatever, you can go ahead. But you also need to know what you're doing. So it requires more skill, more knowledge from the user. And further on, you also need to understand how to scale your infrastructure. But this is then one of the nice things, because it's just your cluster, you can, for example, have dedicated nodes in the cluster that, let's say, have GPUs in them so you can run your machine learning workloads. Or you can take Kubernetes nodes that have more memory if you have very memory intensive workloads. And all of these things are, are aspects that you can customize when you have your own cluster. And finally, one of the benef benefits that we also see is that with a dedicated cluster, you can really decide which type of dependencies you want to take on. So let's say, for example, you have a stateless application and you basically just want HTTP traffic in and uh, then you're connecting to a database somewhere else. 
In that case, your cluster doesn't need any storage, so it doesn't need a dependency on this additional service. And the, low, the, the lower depend no number of dependencies you have, the lower the risk is that you're going to have some kind of outage because one of your dependencies is not available. On the other hand, the benefit of a managed Kubernetes service where you only have access to the API and not the underlying infrastructure is that we can optimize the resource usage much better. This is also what uh, Robin mentioned in his talk earlier today because by putting multiple different tenants on the same cluster, we can utilize uh, the, the inefficiencies between the different workloads much better or we can kind of smoothen out traffic peaks and, and bursts in, in whichever workload you have. In general, also we can, um, it's better for the, if we have smaller and medium sized workloads. So if you have just a small Python application, for example, or just a standard Java application that doesn't need like a lot of resources, then it's, it's much more uh, efficient to run this in a shared cluster. And finally, the, the most important point is that you have a managed infrastructure. So you as a user, you just come to us and you basically have a, have a container as a service platform. So you, you give us a pod and we just run it for you. And that's all you need to take care of. And we take care of handling security upgrades for the, for the Kubernetes infrastructure, for the underlying VM infrastructure, for anything else that needs to be done, replacing nodes if they are unhealthy, all of these things. And finally, especially with, with OKD or OpenShift, you also get a nice user-friendly web UI. And I really want, you know, want to, to, to highlight how important this is and how many of our users, for, for this, is, this is actually their main entry point to our platform. Because yeah, we as experts, we know how to use kubectl or OC or Helm or whatever is our the, the command line tool of the day, but Users are really happy when they can just see their pod that is running and they can click on it and they're gonna see the logs and this is just really nicely prepared and it, it's a very smooth entry to the Kubernetes cloud native world. Now, at CERN, uh, CERN is an academic institution, a research institution, and that means our users also have a lot of academic freedom. Uh, to put it lightly. So we don't have a golden path for deploying containers. Some people are just using um, the, the web dashboard, like I just said. Others are using kubectl, maybe from a, from a CI CD pipeline. Others, again, are using customized manifests or Helm charts. And then we see that the most advanced users have already adopted GitOps approaches, such as Flux or Argo CD. But we also see that there's not really a one-size-fits-all solution because we have a very, very wide range of users. We have people who are from inside IT too, who are absolute experts, who have time to understand all of the details of Kubernetes YAML. But we have also people who maybe just wrote a small dashboard so they can monitor what their, what their sensor is doing. Or maybe they just want a small application that checks if their job that they have submitted to the batch service is still running. And they don't care about all of these details. They just have their Python app or, or JavaScript app or whatever, and they just want to put it somewhere and just let it run there. And in this case, of course, just using a web dashboard to create this deployment once and just let it run there and updating the com container image whenever I need to is perfectly fine. One thing that is very important for us at CERN is the topic of resource management. So all of our projects have a well-defined owner and uh, usually also an administrator group. And this is necessary because again, as a research institution, we have a lot of people coming and going, people who are maybe only temporarily associated with CERN because they have, a, let's say, a, a, they are doing a PhD thesis or, or maybe just a, a student th thesis. So it's really important to keep track of the owner for us so that resources don't get orphaned and then something has been sitting there for five years and we don't know if we can turn it off. And if we turn it off, if, it's, if something is going to blow up somewhere that we don't know about. 
Um, and finally, also associated to these projects are also always resource quotas um, that kind of restrict how much you are allowed to use because we don't do internal accounting, so we don't uh, account for how many resources you're using, but that, that's why we need a, a restriction, a limit on by default how many resources you're allowed to use. Of course, people are allowed to request more resources if they need to, but by default we have low quotas. So let's get into the topic of how people can get a Kubernetes cluster, it's termed. So this is a service that is managed by IT. And as I already mentioned before, it's based on OpenStack Magnum, and which completely automates the pro initial provisioning of the cluster. And um, our team has introduced feature toggles um, so that you can enable or disable uh, very common integrations. So this is things like um, uh, that, your, that your Kubernetes cluster will report to the central monitoring service, that it will log, uh, that it will also send the logs to a central location, the, which kind of storage endpoints you want to have. Um, all of this is very flexible, and, and this is what I mentioned before, is, is what people appreciate about the service, that they can really choose which integrations they have, and also then, of course, which dependencies you have. And the team is using um, Argo workflows since very recently to do continuous testing. So spinning up a new cluster, running the entire test suite over the cluster, and then deprovisioning it again. Uh, in practice, it looks something like this. So you just run an OpenStack COE cluster template list, and then you can see which kind of flavors are currently available. Um, then you run a cluster create command and you specify which flavor you want to have. You just need to specify also then an SSH key so that you can access your nodes. And finally, you can specify additional labels. So in this case, I'm enabling the monitoring component. And a couple of minutes later, after running this command, your cluster will be ready. Pretty simple for users who know what they're doing. Behind the scenes, it looks something like this. So we have at the bottom here, we have the OpenStack layer, so where we have compute, so that means VMs. Uh, and then Magnum is the OpenStack component that takes care of the provisioning uh, together with the heat component. And this kind of spits out some, some resources, so the virtual machines, etc. And then the actual cluster configuration gets applied with a Helm chart. And this, this is where these feature toggles feed into, into this Helm chart which will then um, kind of configure your cluster the way you initially uh, requested it. But I should note that this only happens during the initial provisioning. So afterwards, you can really do whatever you want. If you want to take out the Prometheus and put something else there, that's totally your thing, you're free to go. On the other hand, we're also using OKD, so that is the community edition of uh, Red Hat's OpenShift container platform, uh, which by now, since a couple of years, is really the foundation of the web services infrastructure at CERN. And that is because it provides a multi-tenant, highly available and secure base. It's, it's really amazing if you compare a vanilla Kubernetes deployment to an OpenShift deployment, how much you get out of the box. We then go ahead and enhance this kind of out-of-the-box OKD with additional features that are either requested by our users or that are just necessary to integrate well in the CERN computing environment. So these are things like registering your host name for your, the ingress uh, in the DNS servers, uh, handling automatic certificate uh, renewal and, and requests, um, very important also for us and for our users is the fact that we provide lots of different storage integrations. So our main persistent storage is CephFS, um, but we also have this thing at CERN that is called EOS, which is a giant shared file system which basically houses all of the physics data that it gets produced at CERN and is partially backed by, by tape drives actually. And then there's also things like CVMFS, which is a um, which is a basically a software repository that gets served via the network. And so these, these things are something that you don't get out of the box, uh, even with OKD. Uh, we also handle custom ingress router sharding 
and something that I will come later to is we also add our own operators on top of OKD. Um, so this then, what I just described, is then kind of the shared base of OKD. And based on this, we then have different cluster flavors that are specialized in a particular use case. So our, our most generic and kind of lowest complexity use case is the platform as a service, uh, which currently houses around 1,400 different projects, and it's actually our largest production OKD cluster. And this is really just container as a service. So users just put pods inside, or well, deployments to be precise, uh, and, and we run it for them and we take care of handling all of the infrastructure. But basically the user sees a completely normal Kubernetes API. We also have what we call the app catalog that gives the users much less control over the application and they only have access to predefined application templates. So these are, th are things like uh, Grafana instance, Nexus, uh, WordPress, and you don't actually have a deployment in there, but instead you only deal with custom resources that are backed by operators that we have developed, which will then deploy the application as necessary for you. Then there's also the, the WebEOS cluster, which was actually our first OKD cluster, which uh, is at the moment housing around 4,000 projects. And this is basically just a shared web hosting cluster. So it's serving files from the EOS file system that I, that I mentioned before. But at the same time, uh, it's highly multi-tenant. So it, yeah, like I said, it's housing 4,000 4, websites. But as you can see from the numbers, it's actually only 20 nodes. So it's very, very efficient at what it's doing. And um, sometimes also serving terabytes of data in very short time when one of our experiments, for example, releases new data on the web and people start downloading it. And finally, there is the Drupal use case where our colleagues from the Drupal team have developed an extremely advanced operator for running Drupal websites because Drupal is the most widely used uh, content management system at Stern, so all of the main websites are currently using it. And this Drupal operator uh, provides a really simple interface for users to say, I want a Drupal website with that version and they don't need to take care of anything else. And then the operator goes to the cluster or is running inside the cluster and creates deployments as necessary, provisions databases, makes sure that database migrations are applied and so on and so forth. Now, we don't, of course, want to bore our users then with having to write YAML manifests so they, that our Kubernetes operators know what they need to do. Instead, we have this thing called the Web Services Portal, which exposes all of these features in a really user-friendly UI. So for example, to create a website on this WebEOS cluster that I mentioned before, you basically just need to fill out this form uh, where you say what the host name should be and what the description is and from which path it should be served. And you click on Create. But what happens behind the scenes is that this portal actually does not have any state itself. It just takes the permissions that the user has and creates a resource in the cluster. In this case, a custom resource definition uh, or a custom resource with the parameters that you put in here. The same happens for the Drupal site. So again, I'm just, I just need to say what the host name should be and then kind of which version of Drupal I want and I click on create. And behind the scenes, something like this gets put into the cluster. And we entirely rely on the role-based access control that Kubernetes already implements and that the multi-tenant OKD gives us out of the box. So if the user is in principle to allowed to create such an object against the API, then our web services portal will do the same on behalf of the user. And you can see that the same fields kind of show up here again. So we can see the site URL, we can see that the, the Drupal version has been specified, and then we can see what the, the operator has been doing. So the deployment has been rolled out as expected. Um, it checked if the, any database migrations need to be applied and which backups are available. And all of this is completely automated. 
I also want to mention how we actually manage these clusters. So we have these four clusters that I showed on the previous slide in, in production, plus additional ones in staging and dev environments. And contrary to, to the current trend, we are actually treating these clusters as pets because they are stateful in our case. Users are putting their workloads directly into our clusters, be it a Drupal site or a regular Kubernetes deployment. And we need to make sure that we don't lose it because we cannot just reprovision the cluster because then all of the state would be gone. Um, furthermore, we have, we have implemented this architecture that each cluster that we create is completely self-sufficient and isolated. So it has a separate OpenStack project, it uses separate application registrations, everything is, is isolated from each other. And we don't, um, for example, connect them with different Argo CD deployments or something like this. And this is very important for us so that when we make a mistake, we reduce the blast radius as much as possible. Finally, also, we don't really have a need to, like other people, to throw clusters away and create new ones and move the workloads because OKD4 makes in place cluster upgrades completely seamless. I don't know who of you ever tried to upgrade an OpenShift cluster, but it's really amazing. OpenShift by itself will just go through the entire cluster and update each component that it needs to in the right order and highly available. And as a user, you don't even notice that it's happening. So it will first update your etcd nodes and then it will update your API server and so on and so forth. And it goes through each one of them. Now, as I mentioned before, we deploy a lot of things on top of OKD actually. And for this, we're using Argo CD. Uh, which is, I'll come to in, 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 a, in a future slide, which is a very nice integration into this way of managing an OKD cluster. And finally, we recently also developed an what we call OKD CTL tool that allows us to facilitate common operations such as creating a cluster, deleting a cluster, performing maintenance tasks such as replacing nodes or maybe freezing a work node so that we can debug something. Overall, the deployment then looks something like this. So at the, at the bottom, we still have our OpenStack cloud. Then we put OKD on top of it. And Argo CD is kind of the brain of the entire operation. So it's managing both the OKD configuration, because if you're not familiar with OpenShift, everything in OpenShift is managed through an operator itself. So if you want to change the configuration of an API server, you just edit the API server CRD and you need to change some parameters in there, and then the operator will go ahead and actually put those changes onto the nodes. And similarly for all other components, such as image registry, ingress controllers, etc. And in addition to managing OKD, Argo CD also manages all of the other things, and this is actually just a small uh, sample of the things that we deploy, such as Manila and CephFS integrations for the storage I previously mentioned, third manager, open policy agent, um, then also integration with the CERN single sign-on, etc. Now, using Argo CD for this is really great because it's a natural extension of, the, of, the, of what we are already used to in Kubernetes. It's this continuous reconciliation of resources. If a resource is not in the state that we declared it to, then Argo CD will just make it that state and then this is very nice because the operators, either our own operators or the OKD operators, will then pick up this change again. So eventually the, st the cluster always converges into the desired state that has been described by a Git repository. And what, what in, in addition, what we also like about this approach is that if something cannot be converged into the desired state, we automatically get an alert about it because the Argo CD application is out of sync then. So it might not be that something is necessarily broken in the cluster so that the cluster is completely offline, in which case, of course, we would also notice. But maybe there is just a small misconfiguration, let's say, in the DNS setup. Um, this would then also get picked up by Argo CD. And if it cannot uh, ensure that the resource is in the, the desired state, we will get an alarm about it. 
So it combines really well with this operator-driven management that is already uh, built into OKD clusters. And finally, uh, we are Argo CD, both the, the command line and the web UI, also gives us a great overview of the resources that we have manually deployed into the cluster. And by now, they're really a lot. Like, we're deploying hundreds of resources into the, into the cluster. And of course, you cannot keep all of them in, in your head or always understand where each resource is coming from. But this is why the Argo uh, UI is really nice to, to kind of understand where is this resource coming from, which stage should it be in, and why is it there in the first place. I also want to give a special um, spotlight to the Open Policy Agent, which is a component that we're really using for many, many different use cases, including helping us as the administrators, but also helping our users with some tasks. So for example, helping us, the administrators, is ensuring that each host name, because we have this shared namespace of, or shared DNS zone of, uh, of host names that users can use, is only used once across each cluster so that you cannot steal someone else's DNS name. It's also used for, uh, for the ingress up, uh, setup, um, for volumes, um, for networking visibility, so that uh, an application, for example, is only exposed on our intranet or to the internet or on the technical network, which is then another internal network that we have. Um, but also for more tedious tasks like uh, automation of mount points. So for this, when, when a user wants to mount uh, this EOS file system, we need to t make sure that it has valid Kerberos credentials and then these credentials expire after 24 hours. So we help users by actually injecting an init container and a sidecar container automatically in, into their deployment that already has sets up everything as it needs to. And the only thing the user needs to do is set a small annotation on their deployment and Open Policy Agent will take care of the rest. Like I mentioned, operators, OKDS operators, we're using upstream operators such as the Velo backup operator or a cert manager for requesting certificates. But we have also developed a lot of operators ourselves. And these are what, what is powering these other clusters that are not the generic platform as a service. So we have the WebEOS operator that takes care of handling this shared site hosting. We have a GitLab Pages site operator that integrates with our GitLab deployment. We have the authentication operator that takes care of the entire project lifecycle and tying it back into the CERN single sign-on. We have a LandDB operator. LandDB is CERN's internal uh, kind of DHCP management solution. So that needs, needs to be integrated with DNS if you want to request a new host name. And finally also for each of these application templates, we are using Helm operators, which are a very thin layer if you're not familiar. So it's you basically, the operator SDK allows you to build these Helm operators just by giving it a Helm chart. And then based on the input values of this Helm chart, it will automatically generate a CRD for you. And this is nice for simple use cases such as Grafana, for example, where the user just needs to, needs to say, I want um, this version of Grafana, with uh, that and that host name, then the operator basically just runs a Helm template once and installs the necessary resources in the cluster. And again, it continuously reconciles those. Now, what did we learn during this time of operating these services? Uh, users are very happy about the internal documentation that we have. This might be something if you're if you're building such a service, you might be um, tempted to just skip because, well, there is so much great upstream documentation, and that's true. But still, your users like to have a friendly entry point into your specific service, and then from there, you can link to external resources. Uh, we are also very happy that uh, operators can help us in so many different tasks, both for us as admins, but also for the users. Um, but we also really need to pay attention how we use them because they are very sharp tools. And we just recently, two months ago, had a pretty big incident where one of the operators was actually misconfigured and started deleting a bunch of resources in the cluster. This is where I want to point out that wherever possible, you should try to use soft deletion. So mark a resource as deleted, 
mark it as unavailable, and then just clean it up 30 days later. At the same time, not everything has to be automated. We frequent, relatively frequently have steps that we could automate, but actually it would not be worth the effort because in the end we just need to run one or two commands for five minutes, and honestly, in five minutes you cannot reliably script it. Finally, splitting the Kubernetes as a service offering at CERN into both this kind of unmanaged flavor and the more managed flavor uh, is really beneficial for both services because we can share expertise, knowledge, and experiences, but at the same time, we can serve very, very different use cases that we could never satisfy with either one of them if we just did unmanaged Kubernetes, because then most of our users would just be completely overloaded. But at the same time, if we only had the managed service, we also could not serve all of our users because some of them just have really special requests. Some of them have different compliance or auditing requirements. Some of them have different compute requirements. Others just want a service mesh that maybe we cannot offer to all of our users because it's too complex to implement. So having these two separate services overall is very beneficial for us. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and thank the organizers of this awesome meetup um, for putting this all together. I think it's really well organized and uh, you can find the slides under this link. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jack. It was, um, I just have one question for everyone before I open up for questions. How many shiver when he said tape? There you go. I, kind of impressive. Thank you very much, Jack. Do you have any questions for Jack, please? We have time for three questions. Yes, we do. Where were they? Yes. How do you deal with uh, customers that nuke their own Kubernetes cluster? Sorry, could you repeat? How do you handle customers that nuke their own self-managed Kubernetes cluster and cry for support? Um, well, so, so it's for, for us, it's, it's internal users. So, well, if they want to run their own cluster, they can. We don't forbid them from doing it. Um, this is, again, something that we really try to adjust to whatever the, whatever the, the people need. Um, there are also unmanaged, completely unmanaged Kubernetes clusters. It's uh, really coming back to that academic freedom. If you want to do something, you can. I've noticed that you've got like thousands of different projects and I'm curious how do you handle kind of API updates in terms of uh, workload specifications that change like from uh, one version of Gates to another. Like how do you handle that for so many uh, workloads? That's a, that's a good point. So I, th I would say um, as a starting point, OKD really helps with this because, well, you have all of this support from, from Red Hat OpenShift um, that they already make sure that you get warnings early enough. Hey, this thing is going to be deprecated into Kubernetes versions. Like you should really look into uh, fixing that now. Like what we recently had with uh, Kubernetes uh, cron jobs that uh, the one beta one was deprecated. Um, so that is one thing. And for our internal self, um, self-developed CRDs, there we can actually uh, kind of collaborate with our users and, and do the patches on the fly as we need to. Um, let's say if something changes in the spec, we can say, hey, you need to modify this or that. Uh, it's gonna, the, the behavior is gonna stay the same, just add that field there. I do have one question, Jack. Yes, please. Um, how do you guarantee a good security posture of those clusters that you hand totally over to your users? Um, I would say we don't guarantee it. Um, you can definitely mess that up. We try to provide a good base as a starting point and sufficient references. Um, then there is an additional check that unlike, unlike these uh, OKD clusters, um, you basically need, if you want to expose it to the internet, for example, you need additional approval from the security team. 
And in that case, they will also check that what you're doing in that Kubernetes cluster is actually somewhat secure. So those unmanaged clusters, by default, they are not exposed, at least to the internet. Thank you very much, Jack. So um, CERN um, impresses as usual. We, we are going to have the next talk at 5 o'clock. Uh, just before the next talk, we're going to have two very short uh, pitches from our very uh, beloved uh, sponsors. And we are, uh, so you guys have 10 minutes to stretch your legs if you like, if so should you want to. But this is the best room, so come back here, please. Thank you. Thank you.